So in the last part, we have seen or uh, we have correlated stress components with strain components using a stiffness matrix or a stiffness tensor, which has 36 components. And we have seen that this stiffness matrix remains symmetric. And that is why out of 36 components, you have 21 independent components. And we saw that these are 21 independent components, which are required to completely find out a relation of stress components to strain components. And we have posed this question that how many independent elastic constants you need when we have when we consider a symmetry of a crystal structure. So let's find it out together. Let's consider a crystal structure, find out its rotational symmetry and find out how many independent elastic constants that we need to correlate the stress components to strain components. So let's consider a case of a triclinical structure. As we know that triclinical structure is defined as A not equal to P not equal to C and alpha not equal to beta not equal to gamma. So triclinical structure has a lowest symmetry and I can say that it's, it has no symmetry. So how many independent elastic constants that we need? We need all 21 independent elastic constants because there is no symmetry and thus we need these all 21 elastic constants to correlate the stress components to strain components. So we need 21 independent elastic constants in case of triclinic crystal structure. Now let's consider another crystal structure that is orthorhombic which is defined as A not equal to B not equal to C and alpha equal to beta equal to gamma equal to 90 degrees. Let's find out its rotational symmetry. It has two perpendicular two fold rotation axis. So when I say n fold rotation or n fold symmetry that means if I rotate by 360 by n by this much amount you retain the symmetry. Let us consider an example. Let me write it down. So square has four fold symmetry. It has four fold. That means I divide it by 360 by 4. That means if I rotate a square by 90 degrees it will retain symmetry. That is what it means. You can read more about symmetry in any standard structural metallurgy book or any physical metallurgy book. Now here when you consider an orthorhombic crystal structure specifically this you can see that alpha equal to beta equal to gamma equal to 90 degrees which makes these planes orthogonal to each other. These three planes orthogonal to each other. Now here comes a principle of shear decoupling. Let me write that down what it states. So we have shear decoupling principle which states that normal stresses will not cause shear strains. So in this case in such kind of crystal structure a normal stresses will not cause any shear strains. Let me explain it to you. So when I have a normal stresses acting on these planes it will not cause any shear strains on that plane. Now let's come back to our stiffness matrix and see which were the components relating normal stresses to shear strains. So we know that we have bifurcated nine, nine components each which were relating normal stresses to normal strains, shear stresses to shear strains or normal stresses to shear strains or shear stresses to normal strains and we know that this part this part is where which was relating normal stresses to shear strains this three these nine components like from c14 to c36 so these nine components were relating normal stresses to shear strains now what shear decoupling principle says that normal stresses are not causing any shear strains so that means these components will turn out to be zero. Let me write it down. So these components, all these three components will be zero. And now another important point is that when we consider a shear decoupling thing, let me write it down that also. The shear strain in a plane 
can't be due to sheer stress in another plane let me explain that to you so when i consider an orthorhombic crystal structure what this statement says shear strain in a plane can't be due to shear stress in another plane so let me explain that to you so when you, when i have a shear strain in this plane it may not it cannot be due to shear stresses in another plane so so this shear stresses will not cause any shear strains in this plane or shear stresses in this plane will not cause shear stresses shear strains in this plane or this plane so you can see that these were the nine components which were relating shear stresses with shear strains and what does the shear decoupling principle states is that when i have sigma 2 3 and if i have this kind of symmetry it will cause only gamma 2 3 it will not cause gamma 1 3 or gamma 1 2 so because of this you can see that these three components will turn out to be zero and let me write it that also here so as 0 0 and 0 now how many independent components are that we have so we have these six components and these three components so in all we have we need nine independent elastic constants to correlate stress components to strain components uh, when we consider an orthorhombic crystal structure now let's consider a cubic crystal structure which is defined as a equal to b equal to c and alpha equal to beta equal to gamma equal to 90 degree it has four three fold rotational symmetry and that is let me write it down so that is here along the body diagonals of your cube so this is one of the body diagonal which i am drawing and these are uh, there are four bo body diagonals which you can make and they have three fold rotation now because of the cubic symmetry which is the highest symmetry what are the response you get let's say when i say i have a sigma 1 1 Applied only, you get a epsilon one one one, uh, which is related through C one one. Similarly, I, if I apply only sigma two two, it will have a response epsilon two two, and it can be related to C two two. And if you apply only sigma three three, it will get epsilon three three, and it will be related to C three three. That means when I consider this cubic crystal structure i get relations between sigma 11 c11 and epsilon 11 only and when i only apply sigma 22 i get a response between epsilon 22 through c22 so it indicates that the c11 c22 and c33 must be equal so you have c11 c22 and c33 must be equal because of the symmetry of this uh, crystal structure Uh, let me explain that to you so when i put just let's say this is sigma 1 1 only i get epsilon 1 1 so i have sigma 1 1 and epsilon 1 1 which will be related through c 1 1 when i apply only sigma 1 1 let's say i have sigma 2 2 which will be related to epsilon 2 2 through c 2 2 so because of the let's say sigma 2 2 is here so because of the nature of the because of the nature of the crystal structure you can find out that c11 and c22 must be similar so and similarly c33 also so you can clearly see that c11 c22 and c33 must be equal also when i consider c44 c55 and c66 which are relating shear stresses with shear strains so those also must be equal and remaining this three which are c12 c13 and c23 those also we can show it because of the symmetry of the crystal structure those also turn out to be equal so you have c44 equal to c55 equal to c66 and you can get c12 equal to c13 equal to c23 so how many 
independent elastic constants you have so let me write it down that also so when i know c11 i can know c22 and c33 when i know c44 i can know c55 and c66 and when i know c12 i know c13 and c23 so in all you just have three independent elastic constants to completely define uh, or completely correlate strain com stress components to strain components so for cubic you need just three independent elastic constants now let's go into let's go further and see what is exactly an isotropy of elastic behaviors now here this slide shows young's modulus for monocrystalline copper this is for copper and a cubic zirconia and you can see that for copper the maximum or the maximum value of young's modulus is around body diagonals that is 111 and it has lowest values around 100 Or rather, in case of cubic zirconia, you get maximum Young's modulus in 100 and lowest along 111 direction. So this is how the anisotropy of a elastic behavior. That means you have a different elastic properties when I consider a different plane or a different direction. The values of elastic constants are changing based on your direction. This is what anisotropy of elastic behavior means. Now. last part where which i would like you to focus on is a compliance tensor we have seen a stiffness tensor and now we'll understand what is compliance tensor so in compliance tensor i can write that cijkl that is a tensorial notation and i convert it into a void notation cmn this is this is our stiffness tensor we have seen this which was relating uh, let me write it down so this was relating sigma ij c i j k l to epsilon ij so this was our stiffness uh, tensor here in this case we have written ij equal to m and kl equal to n that is uh, in a void notation So when I convert it back from a void notation to a tensorial notation, let me. So when I convert it back from void notation to a tensorial notation, what I find is that I can convert it back uh, in a straightforward way. So there is there is no change when I want to convert it back to uh, C I J K L uh, from C M N. Now we have a relation. that i write a strain tensor equal to si jkl into sigma kl so that is a relation between strain tensor to stress tensor through compliance tensor so this is your compliance tensor let me mention it here so it is a compliance tensor si jkl now similarly for void notations what we do is like si jkl we write it in Uh, void notation as as m n where i j stands for m and k l stands for n however when i try to get it back uh, from a void notation to a tensorial notation that is as m n to s i j k l it is uh, not equal so you cannot directly convert this as m n to s i j k l and like in case of your stiffness matrix which where i can convert it back easily so cmn can be write it as cijkl or cijkl can be converted to cmn uh, but in this case it's not straightforward so you have to apply some scaling factors and what are they let's look at so we have scaling factors which need to be employed when i want to convert smn to sijkl so let's write it down so if m and n are not equal to 4 5 6 10 smn is equal to sijkl uh, that means if m and r not equal to 4 5 6 let's consider this example here s12 where m is 1 and n is 2 and you can see that they are not equal to 4 5 6 so i can write it as as equal s12 is equal to s1 1 2 2 this is very straightforward and we can write it back from a void notation let me write down so in this case when m and n are not equal to 4 by 6 i can write this as i j k l can be converted back 
from work notation easily. There are no scaling factors involved here. Now, when m and m or n equal to 4, 5, 6, then smn must be multiplied or uh, smn when I try to convert smn to sijkl, it, it, I have to multiply it by 2. So the scaling factor here is 2. For example, let's say when I have s14, I have to convert it into a tensorial notation, I have to multiply it by 2. So we have seen that uh, in void notation, let me write it down. So when you see that 1 stands for 1, 1 and 4 stands for 2, 3. So when I want to convert this S14 to S1123, I have to multiply it by 2. So you have to use a scaling factor 2 uh, when M or N, any one of them is 4, 5, 6. Now if M and N uh, are, or both of them are like, belongs to 4, 5, 6, then SMN must be, when I, when I convert SMN to SHKL, I have to use a scaling factor of 4. For example, S54, where you can see that I have to multiply it here by 4. Let me write it down. Uh, this, so this is a this is 4 here. So I have to multiply it by 4. So we have seen in white notation that 5 is 1, 3 and 4 is 2, 3. So here in case of S54, you have to multiply a factor of 4. Uh, when I want to convert it to a tensorial notation. So these are the things which we need, uh, scaling factors which we need when we want to convert it back uh, from white notations to tensorial notations. Why we need this? So because we want to have these relations to be satisfied that is CIJKL is inverse of SIJKL. And another, another important thing is like we have a symmetric nature of both stiffness and compliance Mat tensor and to maintain this symmetric nature we need the scaling factors and to have this relation satisfied we need the scaling factors so with this i will stop it